Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Are relations between the two biggest powers in the world, China and the United States, on an unstoppable collision course? Let's get to the bottom line. Despite their differences, the U.S. and China have gotten by for decades. Up until recently, American manufacturers loved moving their operations to China. On human rights questions like concerns about repression of Muslims in Xinjiang or suppression of rights in Hong Kong, the nations are passionately divided. In Washington, there are fears that China's astounding economic growth and its attainment of technological and scientific parity in many key industries of the future threaten America's lead position in the world. And they see China as working hard to situate itself as the most powerful nation on Earth. And if that's not enough of a hot mess of challenges, a bipartisan group of U.S. senators and House members have now followed on the trip to Taiwan by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who defied both the White House and China in urging her not to take that trip. China sees Taiwan as part of its sovereign territory, but the deal has been that China won't take the island by force, while the U.S. promises not to recognize Taiwan's independence. That ambiguity has kept the region stable for decades. In protest of Pelosi's visit, China has halted numerous bilateral talks in collaboration on everything from climate change to drug trafficking to regional security and military coordination. And President Joe Biden has stalled any action on lifting trade sanctions imposed by his predecessor, Donald Trump, on Chinese imports. But despite the downward spiral, the two nations are really joined at the hip, doing more than $700 billion a year in trade with each other. So what are they? Strategic partners, strategic competitors, or strategic enemies? And what does it mean to you, to me, and to the rest of the world? Joining me today is China's ambassador to the United States, Qin Gong. Prior to this post, he served as the deputy minister of foreign affairs in Beijing. Ambassador, it's great to be with you today and talk to you. And I really want our audience to understand the Chinese dashboard when it comes to Taiwan. We've seen uh, the trip of, of Speaker, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. You warned her not to go and said there would be consequences. Why does Taiwan matter so significantly to you strategically? Thank you, Steve, for having me. Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan was reckless and provocative because it upgraded the substantive uh, relations between United States and uh, Taiwan, and it violates the U.S. commitments in the three joint communiques of uh, China and the United States that there is only one China, and the government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government representing the whole and the same China, and the United States will not uh, develop official links with Taiwan. And Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, we have heard and we have seen what she did and what he said. It's not an unofficial visit. He said very clearly in her statement upon arrival uh, in Taiwan that her visit is official. And she herself is not a person in the street. She's number three in the U.S. government. And she carries a, a great political sensitivities. So by going to Taiwan, declaring that the United States uh, sides with uh, the Tsai Ing-wen's authority, uh, who, uh, which uh, you know, put the Taiwan independence on its political agenda in the parties the party is a Democratic Progressive Party's constitution. It's a show of uh, the United States uh, emboldening mm. uh, Taiwan independence uh, forces. You know, the consequences are very serious. Uh, as uh, we have warned the U.S. side repeatedly, now we are dealing with uh, the fallout of her visit. One of the things that I have been surprised by after her visit was that while President Biden did not ask her not to go, the national security bureaucracy 
the Pentagon, uh, various national security officials that work for President Biden were very concerned about her, her visit and thought that it would be a trigger. Were you heartened in any way to see that divide in the government, that there were a lot of people in the U.S. government who did not support her trip? Well, we only pay attention to the end result. Mm. The Congress is a part of a U.S. government, and the Congress is obliged to respect and to follow the American foreign policy. In any country, there's only one foreign policy. So you can't say that uh, the executive branch uh, has one and uh, the Congress uh, has another one. And we are dissatisfied mm. with uh, uh, what has happened already. And we don't believe that the executive branch of the United States uh, have done enough to uh, stop her going. What is China trying to achieve in the world? So first of all, China is working for delivering a better life to its own people. You know, this is uh, at uh, the centerpiece of uh, the mission of the Communist Party of China and uh, the government of China. So what we are doing is to you know, make our self stronger and the prosperous so that we can satisfy our people's desire for a better life. And at the same time, you know, China can have uh, many more to deliver for world peace, security, and uh, uh, common development. And China is uh, a force for peace and uh, stability. But regrettably, my country is being misperceived and mm. miscalculated. Uh, some people see China as a, a challenge mm. or even a threat trying to replace the United States. This is the, uh, not our, it's not our intention. So we want to have a, a stable, cooperative uh, relations with the United States because we do believe that China and the United States have a, a massive share uh, uh, responsibilities and uh, common interests. You know, we have our challenges at home. I think that the first thing to do mm. for each of us to manage our own affairs well and uh, a good relationship between China and the United States will serve the interests of our two countries and will meet the desire of the international community for uh, peace, security, and for uh, joint efforts to tackle the uh, common challenges mm. uh, the international community is facing. And sadly, the uh, status quo of uh, China-U.S. relations is very worrisome. Mm. Uh, it's going downhill. This is because, as I mentioned, that China is being misperceived and calculated. And uh, China-U.S. relations now is being driven by fear, not by the common interests and by the common responsibilities of our countries. You know, people forget that you know, the bilateral trade volume annually between our two countries mm. uh, have exceeded the you know, 750 billion U.S. dollars. People mm. forget that before COVID, you know, there are five million mutual visits between our two countries. And people forget that uh, in China and United States are one of the most important trading partners to each other. And the people forget that there, there are hundreds of thousands of Chinese students you know, studying in the uh, United States. And the more and more uh, American young people, they choose China to study. So I think it's time to bring back 
uh, common sense, mm. common interest, and common uh, responsibility back to the center stage of uh, U.S.-China relations. And our differences and the disagreements cannot justify confrontation. Well, I've heard you recently use the term threat phobia uh, and using the escalation of rhetoric over Taiwan and the United States as part of that. What do you think is driving uh, American worries and concerns about Chinese behavior from your perspective? I think there is indeed a fear or China phobia uh, in the United States, and it's spreading. Hmm. Is that racism? I, well, maybe you can make a judgment, but I do feel that, uh, you know, in this country, the Asian hate mm. uh, is on the rise, and the Chinese uh, scientists, Chinese students uh, are feel more and more unsafe uh, in the country. And our normal interactions, cooperations, in various fields mm. are now being affected negatively by fear. I think a lot of Americans look at what they see uh, in China and Taiwan and Hong Kong, and some of what they see are, say, the zero COVID policy, um, where many people are locked in their residence for a very long period of times, and we've seen the YouTube videos, et cetera, of people and their frustration. Or in Hong Kong, we saw massive protests that were, were, were put down, and a lot of Americans, because they believe that that was a democracy movement, or they see Taiwanese that worry about you know, their future autonomy, and, and even some of them, as you said, want independence. There's a sort of affinity that, that many Americans um, feel for that. And I guess I'm interested when it comes to triggering this crisis again in the future, what is your response on those things? How can China either respond on those situations to alleviate Americans' concerns that China is trying to squelch autonomy and, you know, basically basic freedoms and human rights, to have a more trusted relationship there? I mean, I, I'm just sort of interested in why Taiwan is so, such an exploitable situation that, that it can lead to a quick escalation like it did. And I think in part of it is because so many Americans um, basically have empathy for freedom. Mm -hmm. Well, the question of Taiwan, fundamentally speaking, is not about uh, democracy or freedom. It's about China's national sovereignty and the territorial integrity. It's about uh, the national dignity of Chinese people. The historical fact is that China has been part, uh, Taiwan has been part of China since ancient times. And in the history, Taiwan has been, was separated from uh, uh, its motherland by the Dutch colonials and the Japanese uh, invaders, but the Chinese people, we worked so hard at a huge cost mm. to get Taiwan back to the motherland. So people need to understand history and need to know the uh, international law. So what is the, the international law? One China principle. Mm. Kurt Campbell, who is President Biden's coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs, he's a longtime Asia hand, has actually said, don't believe the Chinese on this, that, they, that peaceful reunification is not uh, the agenda that they are seeking, that they use Nancy Pelosi's trip um, as a pretext to position itself better and to, and to, and to take advantage of this moment. A fairly strident um, claim from, from uh, uh, Kurt Campbell. I'd just be interested in how you see that moment. What, what, what were you doing to send the signals that this would be um, troublesome? I don't know, based on what uh, this uh, American senior official uh, openly said that don't believe China will uh, uh, practice uh, or will work for peaceful reunification. 
as I mentioned earlier, you know, people on both sides of the Taiwan Street are all, are, are compatriots, you know, and we will do our best to achieve peaceful reunification. But we will not renounce the unpeaceful means. This is not targeting at uh, uh, Chinese people in Taiwan. This is to deter a handful of uh, uh, Taiwan independent separatist forces mm. and uh, to deter the foreign intervention so that we can best protect the prospect of peaceful reunification. Is there any way to get back to a healthier relationship from your perspective? Uh -huh. Firstly, China doesn't believe that decoupling is in the interest of uh, either China or United States. And it will hurt both of us. And it will hurt the whole world, giving you know, the weight and uh, the, uh, the influence mm. and responsibilities of China and the U.S. And secondly, we do not want to decouple. Mm. You know, we want more exchanges and more cooperation. To get this relationship out of uh, the current uh, difficulties, we need to uh, take uh, some very uh, important uh, principle to heart. That is, you know, this relationship should be built on the principle of mutual respect, mutual trust, uh, peaceful coexistence, mm. and win-win cooperation, as uh, proposed by President Xi. I remember when then Vice President Biden helped arrange the Sunnyland Summit with uh, uh, Xi Jinping and, and Barack Obama. And I was with Vice President Biden in China when he met Xi Jinping uh, the first time. And there seemed to be a very good relationship, a relationship of mutual respect. And Vice President Biden, now President Biden, told me that he respected Xi Jinping uh, and thought that he was a forward thinker. Do you think there's a level of trust still in that relationship and mutual respect? Or do you think it has been now spoiled so badly by uh, the events that you've been concerned about? Well, I'm very concerned about uh the level of uh, trust between China and the U.S. Simply because that China is being s seen as uh, a challenge. Hmm. And simply because that the China phobia is uh, widely spread hmm. uh, in the U.S. So if you see somebody as a friend or a partner, it's something. But if you see somebody as a uh, as a, a threat or a, a challenge, mm. you know, it's a, a totally different story. So how to restore trust? We need to back to the very basics. That is to have a, a fair and objective of China's intention of development mm. and to bear in mind our common interests and the common responsibility, which belie we believe that the far outweigh our differences and the disagreements. We should not let differences or disagreements, uh, disagreements uh, in the way of uh, uh, the development of our relations. And our differences and the, dis uh, and the disagreements uh, should not justify, you know, confrontation and the hostility, hostilities. Ambassador, years ago, when then Premier Hu Jintao was visiting Washington, I was seated next to a guy um, who was the equivalent of the director of the policy planning staff of, of your Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I said, oh, this is a great opportunity. Tell me what's China's grand strategy in the world. And his response to me, kind of joking, was, 
how to keep you Americans distracted in small Middle Eastern countries, which had a ring of truth in it in that era. What is China's grand strategy today? So China's grand strategy is to safeguard world peace, security, and joining hands with uh, uh, people of all other countries for common development and the shared prosperity. And we want to have a, a peaceful and friendly international environment to, for us to concentrate on our domestic development, uh, which will deliver a better lives for our Chinese people. Nothing more, nothing mm. else. And I want, I'm as ambassador, my role is trying to distract the United States from uh, fear of China and from uh, China phobia. And the world is big enough to accommodate China and the United States. Let me give you a story. The first uh, uh, Secretary of Treasury uh, is uh, Hamilton. Mm. And there's a, a musical called, uh, you know, uh, Hamilton. And he had uh, a political enemy. That is uh, Alan Burr. At that time, he was a vice president of the United States. Yes. And the end result was not happy. <laughs> the two men <laughs> to say the least. Had, a, had a deal. Yeah. And at the end of the deal, Vice President Burr lamented that the world is big enough for me and Mr. Hamilton. So let's look at the world today and let's look at China-U.S. relations. I want to borrow uh, uh, Mr. Burr's remarks that the world is big enough for China and the United States. And we don't need to have uh, the uh, tragic incident more than 200 years to repeat itself today. Well, Ambassador Chin Gong, Chinese Ambassador to the United States, I really appreciate your candor and for you joining us today and talking us through these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. So what's the bottom line? Today we talked about the future of U.S.-China relations. My quick bottom line is that the two top global powers will always struggle for dominance. Brinkmanship and rivalry are really baked into this relationship forever. But the cataclysm that would come if the U.S. and China work harder to separate than to cooperate would probably doom us all. So another way must be found to avoid a catastrophic collision. But this week, we're also marking the killing of one of our dearest colleagues, Shireen Abu Akleh, by Israeli forces in Jenin last May. Shireen was a phenomenal journalist, an objective witness to events that she reported on so that all of us would have insights into what's happening. She was killed for doing her job. Analysis has shown that an Israeli bullet ended her life, and yet no one has been held accountable. Impunity is incredibly dangerous, and the death of Shireen is a placeholder for the harassment, the detention, the torture, and sometimes murder of journalists around the world. I hope you will think of her today as we call for authorities to bring her killers the justice that she and we deserve. And that's the bottom line.